Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Carol Fitzgerald from readinggroupguides.com, a website from the Book Report Network. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to our evening event tonight, our evening event where we are going to be talking to Jody Pico and Jennifer Finney uh, Boylan, and we're going to be talking about their novel, Mad Honey. This is our Bookachino Live book group, which is very different from the book reporter talks to interviews. You might be interested, you might be used to seeing me do. Mad Honey was an instant New York Times bestseller in both hardcover and paperback. And I just got the paperback list and it's back on the list again this week. So wonderful, wonderful news about that. You know, I love this line in the description of the book. Mad Honey is a riveting novel of suspense, an unforgettable love story, and a moving and powerful exploration of the secrets we keep and the risks we take in order to become ourselves. Our book reporter reviewer, Nora Peel, had this to say about Mad Honey. Pico and Boylan address important questions about motherhood, domestic violence, and most critically to the pot plot, identity, especially gender identity, and the concept of passing as it relates to gender expression. When my group, my book group, discussed Mad Honey, we had one of our best discussions, and it was really spirited, and we all came to the book with all different kinds of conversations, and I have to say, it's one of the books that we stayed most on point talking about, and I think those of you in book clubs know exactly what we're talking about. We didn't flip to the wine real quickly. We stayed on point talking about it, and this book was one of my book reporter bets on selections in 2022. The format of the program is going to be as follows. And let me start by saying we're going to assume everyone's read the book. We will be talking spoilers. So you were, we were fairly warned when you did this, um, when you signed up. So just know that. I'm going to begin with a discussion with Jody and Jenny. And then a couple of other people are going to pop on screen with questions that they shared in advance that they'd like to be talking about. And then I'm going to share questions that a couple of people who are camera shy asked me to ask on their behalf. And then we'll take questions from the audience from the Q&A. So as the evening goes on, if you have a question you want to drop in the Q&A, do so. And then later on, our voice of God, Tom Donatio, is going to be jumping on and going through those questions to make sure nothing's been already asked and keep the conversation going. We're not going to be looking in chat for those questions. So please do not put them in chat. Put them in Q&A. And, but if you could jump into the chat and let us know what city and state you're from, and if you want to share what we're reading, we always like to see that too. Um, we pride ourselves like having these people from across the country. So with these housekeeping duties behind me, let's welcome Jody and Jenny to the stage. Look at this, so brilliant, so brilliant. So great to see both of you. Hi, everybody. Here. So let's start with where the basic question, how you came to write together and I know it truly was out of a dream. So it was out of take a dream. it away from that. So Jenny, take it away from well, that. Well, yeah, this one's, this one's mine because I guess it started with me. Um, I was in my apartment in New York City. This is May of 2017. And um, I, I'm there because uh, I teach at Barnard in the springtime each year. Right now I'm at my home in Maine, but there I was in New York and uh, I woke from the dream. In the dream, I was co-authoring a book with who? Jody Pico. And in the dream, there were two voices. Uh, one was uh, a young transgender girl, and the other was uh, who had uh, been killed, and the other was the mother of her boyfriend who was accused of the murder. And uh, I think I even got as far in the dream as the question of can you trust your own child? When do you know how much how much can love do um, in terms of understanding your own the, the people that you love? So that was the dream, and I got up, went, and I got some coffee, and I had the coffee, and then I got back into bed with my iPad, and I was on what we used to call Twitter uh, <laughs> back when I used to be on Twitter, and I tweeted out. I just dreamed I was co-authoring a book with at Jody Pico. Um, and lo and behold, Jody in New Hampshire at that moment <laughs> was online, saw the, saw the tweet and sent me a message. What was this book about? And I told her pretty much what I just told you. And she re replied and I, well, Jody, what did you reply? I think I said, LOL, let's do it. 
you said, LOL, let's do it. Yeah. And uh, wait, it's and worth also saying that Jenny and I didn't know each other. Oh. Yeah, no, we'd never met. We uh, And we right. were on, we're, we were part of what used to be author Twitter, which was a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I was familiar with Jody's work going back to the pact, had always kind of, you know, loved her from afar. Um, but, but so that was, that was the dream and that was, that's where it began. And we each had other books we had to work, we were working on, um, and it, it took a while, but I think it was, well, why don't you take it from there, Jody? Cause I think it was 2020 when suddenly things yeah. changed. We both had, um, really busy schedules and most of us writers are embroiled in books that are not, you're not going to see for a few years. So Jenny and I were both writing different things. And we had made um, a date to get together and just start talking about this book in the fall of 2020. And in March of 2020, Jenny sent me an email and said, I don't know about you, but my entire calendar just cleared. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, we were all stuck at home during COVID. And basically um, we started talking by FaceTime and going back and forth in texts and on email, uh, trying to come up with what would become the plot of Mad Honey. Now, it is also worth saying that Jenny and I are very different kinds of writers. Um, so, Just go on, go on. <laughs> so uh, I, I plan everything. I have meticulous, meticulous outlines. Some of my books are so complicated that the outlines are like, 68 single space pages. That's before I write a single word. And Jenny is what we like to call a pantser, meaning someone who flies by the seat of her pants. And I said, look, we're writing a murder mystery. You can't get to the end and say, I don't know who did it. You know, you actually have to have this plotted out in advance. So I sort of, you know, convinced Jenny that we had to do that. Uh, also, also, yeah. oh, it's backwards. <laughs> no, we see it, we see it. We see yeah. It. Also, I am, yeah. I am, yeah. But also yeah, the other thing that, that I decided um, because I'm really smart was that one of the narratives in the book should go in reverse, that we should start oh, yeah. with Thanks, Lily Jody. and go backward in time. So you start on the day of her death and then you learn more and more about her. And um, the reason that I decided that Jenny should write that is because I've written books in reverse and I don't ever want to do that again. It's really <laughs> hard. So I kept telling Jenny, you can do it. This awesome and of course she aced it you know but it yeah really well she was, said don't uh, worry you'll do it <laughs> it was a, a, a huge learning experience and I mean it was really interesting because I had co-written books you know with my daughter before but I could tell my daughter what to do because she was at the time you know 14 years old um, I couldn't tell Jenny what to do Jenny's a terrific writer you know so it was a very different dynamic but in many ways, I actually think that makes Mad Honey one of the best books that I've ever had any part in because Jenny would send me a chapter that was so beautiful and heartbreaking and I would read it and I'd be like, oh God, I have to do something just as good. <laughs> so we were constantly trying to one up each other every time we swapped chapters. So that's what you were doing. We're swapping chapters. Like you had, did you have the outline? You ended, did have the yeah. outline? Yeah, and we, then had the outline. We, had, we had to have the outline, although it was hard to write because, um, well, I mean, Jody, Jody had a pretty good idea of what her part was going to be. Olivia's voice was, we're going to go from learning that Lily is dead through the arrest of Asher and then and then his trial and then the day no more at the end. We, we, we had we had that. Lily's part, um, I, I, I had to sketch out the, the outline going forward, of course, mm -hmm. and then. Um, each one of those, each one of um, those chapters had within it a, a flashback to an earlier time, and each, each, um, each chapter going, going forward in the book, which wound up being going backward, went to a time more distant into the past. Mm -hmm. So, uh, really, it was just like a. I, I tried doing it on my computer, but I literally had to. Um, write the whole thing out on big pieces of paper and get a pair of scissors and scotch tape and then put those pieces in between all of Jody's chapters, you know, wow. going. So so she was going forward, I was going backward. And that was really, um, I don't think I've ever done anything that hard. Uh, mm -hmm. And, w but once we had that, um, then it was kind of like we had the flight plan and we just got to work and 
um, Jody would send me a chapter and I would edit her and then I would send her that back along with a chapter of mine and then she'd edit me with the idea that it would all eventually feel like one, mm -hmm. if not one, one voice, certainly one, one authorial presence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if you know, if you know the two of us, you can probably figure out, I mean, I mean, the Lily parts are mine and mostly and the Olivia parts are Jody's. Although we also agreed to swap characters for one chapter each. So I have one chapter that's Olivia's, that's mine. And Jody had one chapter of Lily's that was hers. And we didn't, in, in the author's note, we explain all this, but we don't actually say which chapters were which. And it'll be interesting to know if anybody on the on the chat uh, yeah. tonight can can make a guess. I think I think my chapter is easier to guess than Jody's, but who knows? I don't think anyone, we've been on tour like all over the place for this book. And I don't think anyone has guessed both chapters yet. Wow. Yeah. Now I've got to go back. Now I've got to go back and say, oh, this is a little test. Okay, see what's going on. It is kind of a test. Mm -hmm. But it also it also was a way for each of us to be able to inhabit the right. other's character, which we thought was really important. Yeah, so it is. There, there was a writerly reason for it too. Yeah, it's not, it's Although be we're like also that. very we we're very territorial about um or possessive <laughs> about what was happening to our characters. And you know, there was something that I I tried to um to do um the 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 character the 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 cop the detective Mike uh, yeah. I wanted him to wind up with with um, Lily's mom at the end Ava and Jody just said no you don't he's mine he's mine. mine I say <laughs> so in the end we compromised and Jody won yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much the way the whole thing went yeah control freak <laughs> I was total control freak totally. <laughs> Jody, I remember years ago when you talked about your daughter writing the book with you. I remember it was at an event and you yeah. said, I was going to write another book. She said, no, she has chemistry AP. And I have never forgotten that. It was yeah. such a great. It's but, like, no. but, but, Carol, she, she is writing now. Yes. She's married. <laughs> She's actually having a baby in December and she just signed a two book deal to write middle grade fiction. So you'll be able to see her books. I know. I feel like my work here is done. Yeah, yeah in all of her, in all of her coming free time as a mother of a baby. Right. Hey, you know what? I did it. She can do it. Well, <laughs> she had a role right. model. She had a role yeah. model. So did I actually? Yeah. yeah. So Jody, you also talked to us about beekeeping because this was a big part of the book, Man Honey. Yeah. There's a reason. Did you have right. your own hives? Did you observe a beekeeper? What did you do? So let's keep in mind this is the middle of COVID, <laughs> right? So I was, and I have asthma. I. Did, we didn't have vaccines yet. We had nothing. I was not leaving my house. I was literally terrified mm -hmm. at the beginning of COVID. The only time I left my house was to do my beekeeping research. <laughs> and I found this guy who is a master beekeeper in Vermont. Um, I live in New Hampshire, right on the border. And I went and observed him uh, twice a week from six feet away with a mask on under my beekeeping helmet. And it was, I, I knew nothing about bees, mm -hmm. nothing. And they are in just the most fascinating creatures. Um, you know, the most, I, I'd say the most salient point for me was learning that, you know, we all know that girls run the bee world, right? You mm -hmm. know, that there's a queen bee. Um, but when a, a queen bee gets old or sick and they know they need another queen bee, this is all in the book, of course, there's um, a moment where the, the nurse bees basically decide they're going to create a new queen. And the way they do that is by feeding the um, the certain cells in the comb only royal jelly instead of other nutrients that would cause that egg to develop into like a worker bee or a drone, which is male or another nurse bee. But if you only feed an egg royal jelly, it will become a queen. What's really interesting is that unfertilized eggs become drones and fertilized eggs become female bees. But if you feed an unfertilized egg royal jelly, that male bee will turn into a queen bee. Wow. Wow. Totally in the theme. Which is what happened to me. <laughs> there you go. It's exactly what happened. There you go. And I mean, I love that. I just love that. And then the other part, of course, was the mad honey part, which... Um, Again, I, I stumbled over when I was doing my research and that that's a real thing. There is, you know, you guys I'm sure have gone to farmer's markets and you've bought wildflower honey or orange blossom honey. And all that means is that the majority of the harvested pollen came from orange blossoms or from wildflowers. Um, and because that has a certain scent or taste. Well, in Nepal, 
if bees go and get the uh, their pollen from mountain laurel plants or rhododendrons in this certain area, they come back and when they, they convert it into honey, it it tastes like honey, it looks like honey, it smells like honey, but it's actually really toxic. And it will, um, you know, at, at best you will wind up vomiting and having severe diarrhea. And at worst you can wind up having heart convulsions and dying. And it actually used to be used for biological warfare. Um, in ancient Rome, they would leave vats of it on the road. And when the approaching army came, because they were always starving, they would be like eating this honey and they would all just fall down, you know, nearly dead. And then the home army would rout them. Mm -hmm. And so mad honey is a real thing. It's the, I, to me, it was this great metaphor that yes. something that, that seemingly is sweet could actually cause you great harm, kind mm -hmm. of like love. Kind of like love. Woo, woo, guys. I mean, you're really on tonight. Oh my God. The red wine is working. You know what I mean? Jenny, where's your wine? Did you get one? Uh, I got, I got one. pink wine. I got pink wine. <laughs> you know, it was a compromise. Jenny, you were so matter of fact about transitioning process and educating through your prose that many readers have told us that they felt less conflicted and more apathetic about the topic after reading Mad Honey. We heard this many, many times. You transition as an adult. How did you channel the character uh, the um, character transitions at a younger age? Like, what were you doing to make sure that uh, it was dead on? Well, for there. it was. I mean, in some ways, it was very easy uh, because the um, the process is the process. Um, mm -hmm. So the transgender stuff was relatively easy. What was harder was capturing a, an accurate um, portrait of uh, of a of a of a teenage girl, mm -hmm. um, whether it trans or cis um because you know my my kids are grown um i'm not particularly plugged into pop culture and so um that was the, actually the hardest thing for me was getting my mind around lily and i, I kind of cheated a little bit because i just eventually made her a nerd like me i gave her my interest in classical music so she plays the cello i made her um a fencer like my children were both on the fencing team uh, and I made her a know-it-all, like me. <laughs> and um, in some ways, she's kind of the girl I might have, I might have been um, if I if I transitioned very young. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I also, I mean, she's she's a very she's a very joyful person. And I hope if if people, I, I mean, I want people to learn about trans issues from from this book. But I also just want something more, something simpler. I want people just to fall in love with her. Mm -hmm. I wanted people just to think this girl is is full of beans, and I just want to hang out with her more and more because she really is, um, she really is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so that's that's kind of kind of how I, I went about it, and um, I'm glad if people feel that um, you know a light was. Uh, a light shined on some of the trans issues because I think what happened we're at this place right now where instead of seeing people as people we see people as issues and it's not just trans people I mean it's it's everybody we um we're so e eager to kind of pigeonhole people into the issues that they represent mm -hmm. and yeah so it's true that um Lily is trans, but Lily is not only trans, and in some ways, the fact that she's trans is the least interesting about her. Mm -hmm. But I hope that there's a thing, I mean, Jody and I have talked about this a lot. There's a thing that stories can do. And I, in fact, if you read any of Jody's books, you learn mm -hmm. about everything from suicide pacts to love to school shootings to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, alternate realities. Um, I mean, there's, but, I mean, you know, the old, the old cliche, show, don't tell, right? Well, you can tell people about transgender people, you can lecture them, but at this point, I don't think anybody wants to hear about it anymore, but, but a story can mm -hmm. open people's hearts and open people's minds. And I, I'm hoping that's what Mad Honey was able to do. I really think it's important to point out that hate is born out of fear. Mm -hmm. it, it's born out of fear of the unknown. And the best way to combat hate against transgender people 
is to know transgender people. It's very similar to the way like um, Harvey Milk suggested that gay people be visible so that you know your neighbor and your teacher and your best friend are gay because all of a sudden it's not so scary when it's someone you know. And I think that there's there's two things going on. A lot of cisgender people who are very well-meaning are terrified about wading into this discussion because they think they're gonna say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Jenny and I did in this book was model a bad conversation, a conversation that goes terribly wrong between Olivia and um, Elizabeth, who is an older trans woman, mm -hmm. because we wanted to make the mistake so all of you don't have to. But we also wanted to give you the next best thing to having a trans buddy. If you don't have someone trans that you are close to that you can ask questions sensitively to without hurting their feelings, well, then maybe you can hear their story instead. Mm -hmm. And that's what Lily does. Lily gives you a fictional, but also a very real story about someone who is trans and who just wants to be herself. Mm -hmm. Just wants to be me. I just want to be yeah. me. I want to be known as, as just as Lily. That's all I want to be known as is Lily. You yeah. know, this is the book, kind of book that had me craving a few more pages. Another chapter, please. I mean, I kept going back to this book and I had a lot going on at the time. Were you that pacing that the two of you were working on? That's what got me doing that. And when you're doing a final read on the book, are you still saying, do I have that pacing going? Is it still there? Is it, or what? when's the moment where you sit there and go, we got it, we're done? I don't know that we ever really sat there and looked at pacing. Do you think yeah. we did that? I think well, probably we, our editor thing we, did that more than we did. <laughs> one thing we, we did do was we tried to figure out where each of my story going back would mm -hmm. fit into Jody's story going forward. So we, we hid the right. fact I don't know if we, yeah, I guess we hit the, that Lily is trans. We didn't reveal that Lily is trans um, okay. until maybe more than a third, not quite halfway through the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, but we didn't, so in the, in the Lily parts of the book, going back, we very deliberately had to do this, this, this fake out where whenever she's talking to the reader about her troubled past, we think it's that she's talking about her suicide attempt or that she's talking about not wanting to lose her virginity so soon to um, Asher. Um, and it's only once once we reveal at the end of that, that um, the medical examiner's testimony that in the next chapter, then Lily starts talking about how, um, you know, I think it starts off for her by her saying, people just tell you to be yourself as if that's the easiest thing in the world, as if it's mm -hmm. not the thing that might even get you killed. Right. Um, and so, but there were a lot of things like that where each there, there's a there's a saying in um, uh, screenwriting, uh, "Come in late and get out early." Yes, which means that the way you write a scene is you you end you end a scene with things still hanging in the air. You don't go all the way to the end, and you start it you start a chapter with things already right. underway. And so wherever I would, you know, get out early, Jody would come in at the next chapter and 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 you know come in late. And so each of the, each of each of our chapters had to kind of talk to each other in a way. And, and we had that all worked out, except somewhere in the halfway part of writing it, Jody said to me, oh, I thought of an idea for another chapter. I'm just going to write two chapters here. And I said, well, yeah, OK, but I think it was you had another someone else was going to testify in the court. And I said, yeah, well, that's OK. But now that means I have to come up with another chapter to, to fit in between those two going backwards in time. Um, that was actually, and it was the chapter where um, I wrote the chapter where um, uh, Lily and Maya go up to an old water tower uh, mm -hmm. and, and um, they yep. find written in, you know, someone's written graffiti, you know, I love Asher, I hate Asher, you know, and, and so there was one one little extra chapter that, that I wasn't originally planning on writing, but um, it, it all had to fit together just like a like a Rubik's cube in a way. It's also worth noting that I had the easy part because when you write a trial, it comes, it barrels toward an inevitable conclusion. Right. But it was a very intentional decision to not reveal that Lily was trans until halfway through the book. Mm -hmm. And that's because we wanted to dupe all of you. Mm -hmm. You all came in there with biases and you made assumptions and you were in love with Lily. And by the time you found out that you know, from the medical examiner that she 
transitioned, it shouldn't have mattered, mm -hmm. you know? And we wanted to catch you in your own bias. That was exactly the point of the book. Does it make you want to go back and reread? This is to the audience. Go back and reread the book because now I want to go back and see like, wait, I was reading this page turning, but now I want to see what you really did. Like go, go back and look at the mechanics of it, which are never evident unless you hear later on, you know? <laughs> Debbie Moore um, from upstate New York is going to join us. Debbie is a, a frequently been part of these uh, events that we've done, these Bucatino Live events. So it's great to see you. And she's got a few questions for you. Oh, hi. It's really hi, nice Debbie. to have the opportunity to meet both of you. Um, Jody, first, I'd like to ask you, I've read many of your books, and they often have two or more parallel storylines that appear, at least in the beginning, to be totally unrelated. Um, like this time with beekeeping and trans issues. Yeah. How do you combine them so that they work seamlessly? Do you write one at a time? Mm -mm. No, I, um, in my 30 plus year career, I have written one scene out of order um, prior to the book that I, I've been working on right now. I've, I've always written a book the way you read it. So each chapter, like if you're reading a chapter, I'm writing the next one. Even a book like Spark of Light, which goes backwards, I wrote it in reverse. So I've never, I've never kind of jumped around like that. Um, I don't, I don't know how I put the things together. I, I honestly, I wish I could tell you why I knew that Olivia was a beekeeper, but I, I came to Jenny like super early and I was like, I think Olivia is a beekeeper. And she's like, yeah, great. Okay, whatever. And, you know, and I don't even think. No, I, I thought it was really cool. I thought it was I thought yeah. it was a cool idea. I didn't quite know. I'm not even sure you know why yet. No, that's it. Uh, I didn't know. I think that for me, gosh. it was about the idea of a queen bee, mm -hmm. which you know has yeah. a whole social connotation. And we knew that at the end of this, Maya was going to be the one left hanging as, you know, our perp. And so I really felt like, um, I think that's where my head was. I was thinking queen bees. And then I was like, oh, wow, I'm doing all this research. And I'm like, wait, 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 you're not going to believe this. You know, <laughs> so every now and then there's this serendipitous thing that happens when you do research. Right. And, and I, I'm a total research hound. I love it. And I love it because I'm carrying my office right here. And so when I go and do research with someone, I'm watching them and I'm listening to them and I'm, I'm asking questions. And the whole time I'm thinking, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that, you know, so I can cherry pick from the research that I'm doing. So um, honestly, that's probably how beekeeping wound up in here. I think I always write my fiction forward, but my nonfiction, um, I don't think I've ever written a book that went from page one to page 300 in order. Uh, the, the, the beginning, the first chapter almost always comes last. Um, and there's just, lo there's lots of moving, move, things moving around. And I don't know, I don't know what I don't know why that would be, but it's it's. Uh, um, I mean, the book I'm working on right now. Who knows? I mean, I just I wrote a new I, this last month. I wrote a new epilogue and I wrote a new introduction. Mm -hmm. I can't and wait I, to. And I took out one whole chapter that I figured didn't work, and that's just gone. <laughs> wow. Thanks, um, Jody. You often write books about very controversial issues, and are these simply? topics that interest you or do you hope that in addition to really enjoying the stories your readers will use these stories as a starting point for a frank discussion with family and friends about these topics no debbie i just really enjoy the hate mail <laughs> <laughs> well, of, of which i'm sure you get quite a bit uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, yeah if you want to get hate mail write a book with jody pico yeah I just, yeah told you you, you know it's my life it's the caveat. Um, you know, I I tend to write about things that I want to figure out or that I want to understand better. And, you know, to be honest, when I when I think about, you know, like Jody Pico 101 being taught at a college one day, I always think someone's gonna like look at the history of my career and say, Oh, the beginning of her career, she was writing about relationships and how they're like never 50-50. And then she had kids and she wrote about all the terrible, scary things that can happen to your kids. And then my kids grew up and I started writing about, I would say, issues that I extrapolated, like the nature of good and evil and abortion rights and racism and um, what it is to be trans and things that are, are hot, hot button flashpoints in our society now. But 
shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. And it's because I don't have the answers. And for me, you know, working through a book, writing a book, doing the research for a book is the way that I learn. And my hope is that I can then pass it on to everybody else. So the answer is yes, both of those. Because ultimately what I want is for you to walk away from one of my books with knowledge and with compassion. Mm -hmm. Um, Jenny, the the mothers of Asher and Lily are very strong characters who have had to protect their children, both from society, but also from their abusive fathers. Why did you portray these men in such a negative light? Did you use them? to counterbalance their mothers? That's a good question. Um, Well, Jody was was in charge of um, uh, Asher's father. Uh, Although I think we we agreed early on that um, it was important. um, Actually, this is real, it's almost, I should almost let, well, Jody, you you, you talk about about what we learned about about that in just a second. But but for for Ava, um, it it was less, well, it was certainly that um, um, Lily's father, um, who, in some ways, to me, I think the most important line, at least for me, in in the Lily parts, is the very end when he's um, basically he's like cut off his child's hair and tied um, uh, Liam as yeah. as as they were known then Liam to to a chair. And um, he says this line, I am not a bad person. Mm-hmm. He sees himself as, uh, and I think a lot of people will see themselves in him, in their, in their um, refusal to take um, seriously the, when, when a child says that they're trans or that they're the other gender, um, there's a way in which th- just, parents and and maybe maybe especially fathers will just not hear it and want to shut it down so Ava so I had to have that element um because I wanted to show um that he's he's not a monster at least not in his own eyes and there there are probably more people in the world who think like him than there are people who think like Ava I'm sorry to say Mm -hmm. but the other thing I wanted to do with Ava was to just to have this mother daughter this very, very close mother-daughter bond. And Ava is a very cool mom and she's given up a whole lot for mm-hmm. her child. She has changed jobs. She's moved multiple times and she's really done done the thing that we all try to do, which is to put our children first, um, but at a very, at a, at a fairly high cost to herself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you should talk about um, yeah so I knew really early on that I very intentionally wanted Olivia to be um, a survivor of domestic abuse and the reason for that is because one of the loudest groups of opponents against trans women are women who cis women who feel that um, trans women are coming into female spaces to make them unsafe like that is people are calling themselves trans to come in and to commit violence and violent acts on acts on women. Uh, this is particularly rife in the UK right now. Mm. Um, there is so much disinformation floating around there. It's it's remarkable. If you have followed some of what J.K. Rowling has said about trans people, it is rooted in this. It's it's very sadly rooted in her own her own abuse and, uh, you know, or situation of abuse and escaping it and fear that that a trans woman is really just a biological man trying to take away a safe space from a woman. Why can't there be safe spaces for women? What's really upsetting about this is of course that trans women are far more likely to be the victim of violence than cisgender women. Mm -hmm. Um, But that seems to get lost in the fray. And what I really wanted was for Olivia to have survived that kind of relationship and to still find compassion for Lily, Mm -hmm. because I thought that might speak to some of those people. There's that line at the end of the um, chapter where she's talking with the, where Olivia is talking with the the transgender woman, um, um, Elizabeth, who lives in the the town, who runs the music shop and, Mm -hmm. They're, as they walk away from their conversation, a couple of people 
pass them by and, and they can hear them laughing, laughing at Elizabeth, who's, who does not pass and who's very obviously trans um, and who's kind of constantly receiving snickers from people. Um, and Olivia thinks to herself, I, I, I wonder what it would be like to, to be a woman who is always feels in danger like that. Oh, maybe it would feel like it would be something like being a woman like me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I really like the way there's a sense of a real connection between a woman who is feels endangered from male violence and a transgender woman who, um, in a different way, is always under the threat of violence and particularly under the threat of violence from men. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, this is a book about finding the things that we have in common instead mm -hmm. of focusing on the things that make us different. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's yeah. just another element of that. Yeah, definitely. Feel um, that one final question. Uh, I know you're both you've both written a lot of books on your own, and now you've written and you've written books with other people. What are the main differences when you're writing with a co-author? Are there certain things that are easier and certain things that are more difficult? I think it's harder to write with a co-author. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. We that. thought it was going to be easier. We thought it, it would be half the work, but it was like yeah. really twice the work. Twice really, the work. because not only and and Jenny said this beautifully, but. Um, we, I didn't want this to sound like two different voices. There's already, you know, there's this really weird thing right now with co-authorship and I blame James Patterson because like people who, who have a co-author, readers assume, oh, she didn't write the book, which is total BS because we both worked really, really hard. And, you know, I think that if anything, like I said, you got more from us because we were always trying to one up each other. But um, to me, the idea of having two voices that melded into one was really important. I used to tell Jenny, I didn't want it to sound like two pigs fighting under a blanket. And um, and there literally are, because I edited all of Jenny's chapters heavily and she edited all of mine. There are things that we've written in that book that I honestly do not remember if I wrote it or she wrote it. Right. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I'll just say, you couldn't ask for a more generous and um, enthusiastic um, that that's the wrong word. Just Jody kind of powered me up. You know, every day when I thought I couldn't do something, she would say, "Sure, you can." And mm -hmm. um, sometimes she would sometimes she would suggest um, uh, ways of working working out uh, a problem. But um, you know, I, and I know Jody has a, a much larger fan base than I do, and has written you know many 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 number one best New York Times bestsellers. Um, but so there's why I joke I'm the Garfunkel in this relationship. <laughs> but but for but for all that, um, well, for one thing, I would say every every Simon should have a Garfunkel. Mm -hmm. But you know, I could also say how lucky, how lucky was well, how lucky was I to have Jody Pico as my co-pilot and who was always watching out, always watching my back. And I would say you know, we had a number of offers that people wanted us to do tours. In fact, I think we were we were invited to Australia for a whole book tour, but they only wanted Jody because my books haven't been published in Australia. And Jody said, "Nope, sorry. If you don't want if you don't want the two of us, we're not doing it." And 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 we didn't go. Um, so I just you know um, it, it, you know at the end of that that phone conversation that we had. Or the 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 DMs that we tr that we swapped on on Twitter that that morning a long time ago, um, I was just kind of stunned that I, I guess here I am about I'm going to write a book with Jody Pico. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've heard she's good, <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the conversation, I said, "Geez, I hope maybe tomorrow I have a dream that I'm co-authoring a book with Stephen King." And Jody <laughs> said, "Jenny Boylan, don't we all?" <laughs> and, you know, it's also the best thing about this book honestly is not even the book it's that someone whose books I've read and enjoyed became my friend mm -hmm. you know like Jenny and Jenny's like my sister now forever right and we, were, we went to Disneyland together <laughs> we just had like 10 hours off because of a plane problem and I was like we're going to Orlando we're going to yeah. Disney World. It was we're amazing. 
<laughs> we That's rode perfect. we rode uh we rode space mountain we went we to and, and we went to winnie the pooh's honey pot i swear <laughs> to god we did um yeah and you know and, and in all seriousness i would say you know being an author on tour i mean in some ways it is it is a pretty cool glamorous thing you know yeah. you're staying at four seasons you're flying first class but there's also an inherent loneliness to it because you know it's just you yeah. um, it's and and you know you you kind of hope that the person is there to meet you in some strange city when you arrive but here we were together like in you know from seattle to scotland we were together and i don't know about jody i never got tired of, of hanging out with jody pico i would yeah. like to do it all over again yeah we had a lot of fun we really did it was really really great no i love it i love it thank you um so much i mean i really love the book um i also am a lawyer and i loved the trial you Thank you. It. Would you like to give me an honorary JD, please? I'm waiting for one. <laughs> I mean, you did such a great job at those scenes because it was like being in a courtroom. Thank so, you. Thank thanks. You so I can't wait to hear what both of you are working on next. Thanks a lot. Debbie, thanks. as always, thanks for joining us, too. We appreciate your questions. And now My Heather pleasure. Hood is going to join us from Charleston, South Carolina, with her question. Hi, Lee. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello. How are you? Good. Great. I just wanted to ask each of you, what was the most surprising thing you learned while writing this book? <laughs> huh. I think um, it was probably Mad Honey, what, that, there, that it exists. Yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? You know, I mean, when I stumbled upon that, I was like, wow, that's, that's incredible. Um, that was and I, I knew nothing about any of that. So for me, that was probably the most remarkable thing oh no 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 jenny the most amazing thing i learned is what i made you write about full bladders oh you're not gonna make me talk about that are you <laughs> <laughs> really that's what we've come to oh, it's so cool so glad I asked this question yes I'm, yeah cool for you all right uh, well it, it, it's in the book folks it's in the book it's in the book for yeah. trans transgender women um who are post-surgical uh, because of the way um, everything is rearranged in the area, which in Ireland is known as down below. <laughs> um, if you have a full bladder, um, it uh, is rubbing up against some very sensitive tissue. Mm -hmm. So it is possible, it's possible to, to if, if, you, if you have a full bladder while you're sleeping, um, to wake up with a, with a very pleasant surprise. That's mm -hmm. that's all I want to say. <laughs> was that was that it right related enough? Um, I think what I learned is this, that, that I was just shocked that I could do this and that um, that we could do this. Um, it gave me great hope. I mean, I got to see a writer who's much more famous than I. Um, Ex extend that the 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 magic wand of that gift to me and to um sweep me up in her arms like a sister and to um treat me with 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 respect and with love and the, the together the two of us did a very hard thing not just writing a book together but writing a book with two voices of one of which is going backwards in time and there's a surprise because you don't know that one of the characters is trans until the halfway mark, and then there's the there's a there's a a, a murder trial, and then there's a surprise at the end. Um, and all of this is, you know, I mean, Jody and I complain a little bit about um, the tension between so-called literary authors like me and so-called commercial authors like Jody. And what I learned is that. That, that distinction really in the end means nothing mm -hmm. uh, because Mad Honey is a very literary book and the parts that are literary, literary are not necessarily the ones that I wrote. And it's a very commercial book and the book, the parts that are page turners and thrillers are not necessarily the ones that Jody wrote. And so um, it, it, it made me, and you know, it, it started as a dream. I mean, I hate to say that dreams can come true but in this case, it actually did. 
and sometimes it really does. And when those dreams come true, you can really sometimes see into the true goodness of people. Sometimes you see other things as well. But in this case, I got to see really how good people can be and how good a good friend can be. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. That's really, really lovely. I, I want to thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you so yeah. much. So Nancy Foote from Arizona was unable to join tonight, but she asked that I share these questions. Jenny, in what ways did tra being transgender make it easier to write this story? And what were the challenges that being transgender brought to this writing? Well, you know, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to preach. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted, I just wanted, I just wanted people to love Lily for who she was. Um, but at the same time, I, I know that people reading the book are going to want to get to a point where they, they're going to want to need to know more and Lily's not around to tell us anymore. So, I mean, fortunately I came up with another stand in, which was that character, Elizabeth. And I, I can confess now that's not, that's an Olivia character chapter. That's the one, that's the Olivia chapter that I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and which I don't think is any great surprise really, but, but I came up with another stand in who is, um, I mean, Elizabeth is a lot like me too. I mean, she's closer to my age. Um, she lives in a little town. Um, she knows what it's like to have people mock her to her face. She knows what it's like, you know. So I put her in there so that she could um, kind of explain it and essentially take the reader by the hand. Well, Jody was talking about this before, to take the reader by the hand and let Olivia ask all the awkward questions um, that I that I know people wanted answered. Mm -hmm. So that was, so being trans in some ways helped me and in other ways uh, it was difficult because I, I just, I just wanted it to be a story. I didn't want it to be a lecture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think also though, Jenny, you talked a lot about the difference between coming out when you did at your age and Lily's age. So yeah, much. well, twenty five years ago, when I when I came out, um, everybody was generally very nice to me because people had never heard, didn't think most people had never heard of it before. I was mm -hmm. the first transgender people that when I came out, I was the first trans person that most people that I told had ever heard about. You know, um, nobody had been taught that they were supposed to hate me yet, um, and nobody you know, nobody gave me the what abouts, like, well, what about trans women in sports? Well, what about uh, kids on hormones? What about um, men, men, you know, in, in, in women's rapists in prison? You know, what all of these very fairly obscure topics, which, I mean, they are, they're important topics and I, we could talk about them if we were talking about something other than that, honey. But, um, you know, when I came out, people were generally loving mm. and coming out now, in some ways there's much, there's increased visibility. Um, I'll bet almost everyone on this call has a child in school who, who either has a trans kid or knows a trans kid in the mm -hmm. school. It's, it's people are, people are out now, which is great, but mm -hmm. with increased visibility has come increased blowback and, um, a certain cohort has wasted no time in picking people like me as the greatest threat to society, even though we're 0 0.06 of the population. Um, state houses across the country have decided that this is the threat which must be stopped. And of course, it's not really about any of that. It's about finding someone who's different to belittle and other eyes and turn into a threat. It's what we, it's what happens in the run up to fascism. Yeah. Time after time, it, we find some minority and turn them into the devil when always we're just people trying to live our lives in peace. Mm -hmm. You know, Nancy also wrote this, and I'm gonna see if I can do this without crying because <laughs> when I first read it, she also wrote that she has a son who is transgender and said, I learned a lot from this book, even to be able to say, I have a transgender son. I'm eternally grateful. And oh. I think that's a pretty powerful thing for a oh. book to have done. And I read this and I'm I tearing up now. Okay. 
So just think of what this reader said after reading this book and what this book brought to her as being grateful. And I think that's a remarkable thing to have been able to do. So cold body chills. That's awesome. Body chills. A I'm, lot of people who've written to say things very similar to that. Grandparents who say, you really helped me understand my trans grandchild. Um, you know, I think when you write a book, you hope it's going to change hearts and minds, but you don't always know if it will. And yes, we have had hate mail, but we have also had some really lovely mail. My mother used to say this thing. And I don't think this made it into Mad Honey, but my mother used to say, it's impossible to hate anyone whose story you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, now you know Lily's story. Mm -hmm. You know Lily's story, what's going on. And, and, and you know Olivia's, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, love is expressed so many ways. Lisa Hickman, who's on our team, couldn't join us tonight. She said it's romantic love, the love of a parent, of a child, self-love, acceptance. All of that is in this book, and it's all balanced so well, because you're really seeing all of those things coming across. And I think that's just something we wanted to be sure that we brought out. So I'm sure that Mad Honey, uh, Tom Donatio is our voice of God. He's our editorial director. He's the power behind all the reviews and everything that you see on the site. And he's going to be our voice of God tonight with questions from the audience. Um, Tom, do you have anything for us in the Q&A? Yes, we do have a few questions here. Um, God. Now, uh, now, I know that, um, Jody, you had talked about the transgender revelation as being a way of surprising readers. Uh, but Susan wants to know, why did you decide that this should be part of the book? Uh, she said the trans portion of the book was done in a subtle and very good way. I think we always knew that we were writing about trans rights. You know, that was, otherwise it's basically, it's just a, a mystery, a murder okay. mystery, but, um, which is fine. But I think the reason that I was attracted to working with Jenny, in addition to her incredible skill and finesse as an author, is that um, I, I, that was something, gender and and questions about gender and particularly the hate that seems to coalesce around gender was something that that I wanted to know more about and wanted to, to I think, hopefully begin to piece together the origins of it and maybe make some change. Mm -hmm. But I am not trans, I'm a cisgender woman, you know? So was that my story to tell? Not really, um, but I can very easily tell the story of a mom who thinks, mm, what if my kid isn't who I thought my kid was? Which, oh, is exactly what Ava would think about her kid. You know, so for me, having Jenny on board gave me access to a voice and an experience and a life I haven't lived. Mm -hmm. um, but for that reason, that was what was so attractive to me about this project, that I got to learn myself. I got to um, educate other people. And I got to do it through the power and voice of someone who's been there and has lived that life. Mm. Wow. Tom, anybody else? Yeah. Um, so we have a question from an anonymous attendee who says, um, do you believe that Asher's response of undying love for Lily, regardless of gender, is a typical response of a partner? I also wonder if Lily became Liam, if the transition would have been as challenging and painful. Hmm. I'm gonna um, can I speak yeah, to love first of all? True story. I said to Jenny, when I was writing this stuff for the trial, I'm like, I need to see trans genitalia. I was like, I got, I, I want to know what we're looking at here. And I can tell you categorically, because somewhere there's a file on my computer you would not be able to tell the difference between my parts and a trans woman's parts, period. And that to me was really eye-opening. The reality is there's a good chance that if Lily could pass, Asher might not have really known unless she told him. Mm -hmm. And you know, part of the book is about how much of ourselves can change and can we still be the same person in spite of those changes? And Lily is still Lily, no matter what. Lily has always been Lily. So for me, um, I kind of love the fact that that romantic love is very pure. It's very real. I don't think it is a stretch. And I think that when we hear about terrible things happening to trans women, when they get you know 
when they get murdered at bars, it's because a man feels like he has been duped mm -hmm. by a trans woman because he didn't know she was a trans woman. And well, does that mean I'm gay? Or I don't know what goes on in their heads, but that was the complete opposite of Asher. And I thought it was really important for Asher's character. I'm very protective of Asher, as Jenny can tell you. Yeah, Asher is really all Jody. It's just about yeah, all I Jody. Love him. Even but, though Lily has Lily has scenes with Asher, but he, that, yeah. he, he was her boy. And Asher's not perfect, but Asher very much needs to ingest this information, comes out on the right side of the information, which is great, and doesn't want to say anything because it's not his secret to tell. Could you ask for anything more from someone you love? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he does. It, it, I think it's important to know he does take like a week where he, I mean, he when she first tells him, I mean, he climbs out the window and he's gone. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, and he's gone for like a week um, as Lily just assumes, assumes the worst that he's like every other boy who's ever known. Um, and plus they've had sex, unlike the boys, other boys that she's known. So she's very, very worried. Um, is it, I mean, he, 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 after he's thought it over and he, he figures it out and he comes down in, in a good place. Um, is that typical? You know, I don't, I don't know. It's certainly, it's certainly typical for Asher. It's certainly true to the character that Jody created. He's, he's a, he's not a perfect young man. He, he has, he has a temper. He, um, you know, he's, he, he, he obsesses over things. Um, but he's a good guy at heart. And I think that comes through. The world is, we know the world is full of villains. You know, we know the world is full of people who do other people harm. But, you know, as Mr. Rogers used to say, look for the helpers because mm -hmm. the world is full of good people too. Um, lucky for Lily, Asher was one of them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a lucky Very thing. Good. It's a good thing. How many have somebody um, Karen wants to know um, if you had any alternate titles for the book. Ooh. Huh. Uh, yeah, actually, Jody had one early on that I fell in love with. We were going to call it Smoke and Honey. Yeah. Uh, which I really liked because, uh, um, uh, it, well, because, you know, you use a, a thing called a smoker to put to put bees in a, in a trance when you, when you get the honey. <laughs> and I, I kind of thought, well, that's like us. Like, one of us is smoke and one of us is honey. I'll let you guys figure out which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in the in the end, when she came up with Mad Honey, it was very clear. Right, that's it. That was that was it. Beautiful cover too. It's a really beautiful yeah. cover. And those are rhododendron leaves on the on the uh, petals on the front, which is you know the uh, the flower that makes Mad Honey. Those are those are the actual petals. Mm. Yeah, it's a beautiful cover. Stunning cover. Also, can I just say one more thing? Um, the original cover had Jody's name in great big letters and mm -hmm. my name in somewhat smaller letters right um and jody pico sent sent it back to the, to design and says no we are in this together everything 50 50 um so uh that was i mean it's a, i just wanted to say that i know i meant just made this point before but it's a, it's a very small thing but it meant the world to me and I love too, because it talks about both of your books that you've written before on the cover. It's not just one. And I think that's, okay. you know, it says a lot as well. Yeah. I mean, for all the praise that she's throwing on me, she's, she's pretty <laughs> impressive in her own right there. Yeah, I would have to say like 18 books. I was like, wait a second now. I did not know that. I keep writing know? them until I get, get it right. <laughs> 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 Tell us there's something else. We yeah. Um, I, I know you, um, talked about your different uh, writing styles earlier. Um, Sheila wants to know, did you plan from the beginning of the book who the real murderer was? Yes, that was the point. Like yeah, I said, we had you can't get to page 400 and go, oh, 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 who do you think should do it? You have to leave a paper trail. Or else Although I would say, I think I, 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 was, I put in m more of the false leads. You did a um, lot of the uh, red herrings. Uh, yeah. I put in a lot, yeah, the red herrings, the, um, the, the, the father, in Seattle and and good old Dirk yeah. uh, I was I was kind of hoping Dirk would would wind up doing it in the end but that's so not here's one thing that's really important though there were we talked a lot about the fact that we were ultimately we were writing a book where a trans woman dies 
which is not great, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because of that, it was really important to us that the reason that she dies is not because she's trans, but because she is a threat as a woman to another young woman. Mm, because I think, I mean, yeah. it's not that Lily, you know, was like, oh, that would be great. That's a great way to die. But I think there would be something in that that makes it very different from some of the, the trans panic stuff that leads to the murders of trans women because mm -hmm. i'm in love and i'm gonna do something about it i'm gonna go in i'm gonna win i'm gonna win in love i'm gonna win and you're the one who's taking him away from me mm -hmm. yeah we have a, another question from anonymous attendee why did may get away with it after asher had to go through a trial very good question yeah. Legally, debbie can back me up on this um, legally, the odds that they would trot out a whole new trial on Maya, particularly when it was probably going to be um, something that wasn't murder, but manslaughter, would be very, very slim. Um, it's really always up to a prosecutor if they're going to be the one to press charges. And the prosecutors that I spoke to when I was doing my research said it probably would not happen, mm -hmm. which is incredibly unfortunate because Asher is definitely put through the ringer. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, she probably would not have been charged. No. Um, and we have a question from um, from Elizabeth. What makes an endearing character? How do you plot um, and write one? But Jenny's uh, going to say, I bottle it after myself. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Very funny. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, you have to find something about the character that is uh, both familiar, but also unique. Um, uh, the, the, the character has to feel real, first of all. So you have to give them, um, you know, all of the, the little um, uh, habits and turns of phrase and all the little things where you can, you can see this character. You can see uh, Olivia, you can see Asher. I mean, you can, I mean, you can really see Asher um, and Lily and Ava and even the dog Boris, um, you there there you can you can see them, um, and you want to see them doing the right thing, but you also want to see them struggle a little bit to do the right thing. I think we're much more likely to respond to someone who, um, oh, what's the phrase? Something about um, there. It's one thing to see that someone's happy. It's another thing to see that someone um, is happy who had to win their happiness, who mm. who reached their happiness after crying a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think all of those complications, at least that's how I go about it. Jody, what about you? Does that, does that work for you? Yeah, I think it's about um, finding something in a character that other people are going to relate to. You may not be a beekeeper. You may not have a kid who is, you know, on trial for murder, but you may have had a moment with your kid where they did something that you did not think was in character for them. And I think that's, for me, the way that you find your way into a character. It's making sure that the reader has a splinter they can snag on mm -hmm. that in some way says, I'm like her or I'm like him. Wow. I have to sit there and say, like, which, who am I thinking about? Where am I going back to in this? Right? Who do you think? Yeah. It's a reread, everybody. This is a reread. I'm telling you, the discussion, a reread. Tell me anything else. And I don't yeah, we have a, a couple more questions. <laughs> uh, a couple more questions. Um, Donna asks, what message would you hope that readers take away from your book? Jody? Oh, God, I can't remember the three of them. It was, I wrote it at the end of my author's note. Can you help me? It's to give, to give some, uh, respect to give some hope and to give a damn something like that yeah you, so you didn't want anybody to take away anything you wanted i don't want you to take give. away here I'm, I'm, yeah. now i've done this so many Thank times you. You. i've so got your times. lines this I is what jody pico is so jody pico wants you not to take anything she wants yeah. you to give she wants you to give a damn and she wants you to That's care that um people who seem damn. to be like issues yeah. are really human beings and deserving of love I was remember that, that, it was to give a chance, to give a thought, and to give a damn. That was what it was. Just goes to show I can almost do Jody, but I can't completely do Jody. <laughs> yeah. 
And I think that's really important. That's really all I want people to do. I don't, I don't want them to take anything away. I want them to just be a little more mindful. Mm -hmm. And the next time you hear someone complaining about bathrooms or swimmers or anything like that, um, you think, hold on a second, maybe I should intercede in this conversation and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't get carried away. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be great. We need more people. We need people to step into this conversation. And we to need understand. People. And to yeah. understand. Yeah. We honestly need people to be just as loud defending the rights of people who are different from us mm -hmm. as the people who are saying um, these people are a threat. We have um, one more question. I'm going back to the dream that you had talked about in the beginning. Denise wants to know, what are you both dreaming about these days? <laughs> oh, God. I'm not dreaming. I have a 17 week old puppy. I don't get <laughs> um, do you want to talk about what you're doing? No. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm dreaming about. Um, um, I'm, I'm dreaming like right now I'm, I, I have this kind of bifurcated life in which I, I spend the January through April teaching in New York City. Mm -hmm. And then I spend the summer and the fall um, writing and being here um, with my, my wife here in our house in Maine um and we're, we're at the very tail end of the leaf season right now it's just about almost over another week or two and then it's going to be very bare and then we're going to start thinking about what comes next which up here is winter and many many months of winter and so i'm thinking a little bit about i'm thinking about the time the time ahead and actually getting back into the classroom i'll be teaching a class a new class this spring in what it's called Metamorphosis and Desire, mm. and the reading it's it, the reading list includes everything from Ovid and Kafka to Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. It'll do include Roxane Gay's um, book um, Hunger, um, cool. uh, Maggie Nelson's book um, The Argonauts, um, uh, um, Flowers for Algernon. There's like a lot of there's a lot in there. So I'm thinking about all of these books that I'm reading and how I'm going to to teach that class. And I'm thinking about my next book, which is what about are you writing now, Jenny. What, writing what now? I'm writing now is a book called Cleavage. What? <laughs> I said Cleavage, and the subtitle is Men, Women, and the Space Between Us. So it's about two things. It's about the difference between manhood and womanhood, as I've experienced it. Um, in everything from uh, food to voice to work to motherhood to fatherhood. Uh, and it's also about the difference between coming out as trans 25 years ago and coming out now and how things have changed. And it's my hope that it will give people um, um, a sense of how far we've come. And it will also give some people, including transgender people, a little bit of hope for the future to remind them how far we've come and how many, how many hurdles we've 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 already gotten over, and um, so it's it's a I hope it's a, a hopeful book about not just looking back, but also about um, good things that will come in the future. Hmm, it's fabulous cleavage. <laughs> um, I hey, like can I just say real, really quickly? By the way, Jody, you see up just on the chat there, Susan Finney from Houston. Yes, uh, that's, that's my sister-in-law, uh, <laughs> my wife Dee Dee's. Um, Sister Susie, hi Susie in Houston. Uh, Susie, to whom uh, the book is at least partly dedicated. Anyway, back to you, Jody. Um, I like I said, I'm really not dreaming because I'm hardly sleeping because we have a new puppy, and that is like having a newborn in the house. Oh um, my God, I'm, I'm so really jealous. No, you can have him. He's really. <laughs> oh, I want him. Um, I'll take him. <laughs> he's really cute, which is a good thing. But uh, I have been also. Um, I just sent in a, another revision of a book that will come out next fall, which is called By Any Other Name. And I have been very vocal in the past about gender discrimination in writing. And in the book that I will be publishing next fall, I will convince you that Shakespeare did not write his plays, but a woman named Amelia Bassano did. Mm. And there is historical fact for this record. I have pieced it together and 
I, I will convince you. I've convinced a bunch of academics and I'm really proud of that. People don't know who she is now, but after that book comes out, everyone's going to know who she is. Whoa, look at this. Look at Jody takes on Shakespeare. <laughs> you know, look at this. Well, but it's also, I think it's also about the, I mean, it's it's history, but it's also right now because <laughs> yeah. Jody and I both know, I mean, yeah. you know, now that I'm a woman in publishing, mm -hmm. things are different than they used to be. Um, things don't right. get reviewed as much. And things that I publish are either thought of as, you know, in the ghetto of, of LGBTQ <laughs> fiction yeah. or worse, it's just women's women but right so uh and, and that is you, it's a, the the book that i'm writing focuses on the theater world which is very similar to the publishing world but there is still discrimination against mm -hmm. female writers uh whether you're a playwright or whether you are a, a fiction writer and um you know basically not a heck of a lot has changed in 400 years and it's worth plugging at this point the fact that jody has got not one but two uh, musicals um, in in production or or in the works. You should talk about that too, Jerry. Tell us, tell us. Yes, yes. See, I'm not even dreaming about that because I just closed one. <laughs> um, I had I started writing librettos for musicals about eight years ago, and one of them, which was adapted from the the series I wrote with my daughter, um, Between the Lines, was released. Um, it went out on Off Broadway in 2022. It is actually just about to be released in licensing. If anybody in their school groups or, you know, uh, regional theaters wants to do it, which is really exciting. And I literally just got home from six weeks in England where we launched an adaptation of The Book Thief written by Marcus Zusak, which is a very beautiful story that is extremely timely right now about the power of words to do great harm and to heal. Mm -hmm. Wow, so that closed already. So that's, the, the, uh, you were there? Was it we six over, weeks? It was over in Leicester uh, and Coventry and with, our fingers crossed we will wind up in London next fantastic fantastic congratulations on that we're looking forward to what you're both writing again I mean this is going to be great cleavage and the female behind Shakespeare the female Shakespeare who was really Shakespeare I don't know maybe we'll be able to find out a lot of things you know this book has an epigraph from um, Soren Kierkegaard that it says I love this life can only be understood backwards but it must be lived forward and I think that's something we saw in this book. And I feel like this is a great way to end this evening's discussion because I want everybody to be thinking about that and do the reread of the book. I've seen that coming up in the chat. I saw somebody say they read it from the library and now they just ordered it and so that they can go read it again. And I love moments like that because that's what we hope to do is bring people from across the country together to have these kind of conversations. So it was very special for us for both Jody and Jenny to join us this evening. Thank you so very, very much for your time. Thank, thank you, you for Pearl, having me. And thank you, everyone who came out tonight. We really appreciate it. Appreciate Good night, everybody. Time. Good night, everybody. Okay. And I have some news about two upcoming events that we're doing both in November. Our next Bookachino Live book group event will take place on a Thursday, not a Wednesday, folks, November 30th at eight o'clock. And our author guest will be Danny Shapiro and we'll be discussing oh. her latest novel, Signal Fires, which is now available in paperback. Now, registration for this is available on Book Reporter, Reading Group Guides, as give us a couple of minutes after this is over. And then Signal Fires is also the prize book in our What's Your Book Group Reading contest on Reading Group Guides this month, where tell us what your book group's reading, and you're eligible one of one of three uh, gr groups of 12 uh, copies of this book, which is what we did with Mad Honey a couple of months ago. And then on Wednesday, November 12th and 8th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to be hosting our Final Bookachino Live book preview of the year. This is where I talk about, we started during COVID, of what we figured no one could leave their house and go to a store. So we, in one afternoon, came up with this idea in June of 2020 that we talk about what's happening in the next four weeks and then a look ahead. And we're still doing it. And we still go and so we're going to be talking about what's coming out Jan, uh, November, December, and look ahead to January and February. So we want our readers in the loop. And then um, what we'll be doing is a traditional year end event in December, where some of our reviewers will be sharing their favorite books of the year. Keep in mind that this is going to be available on our YouTube channel. And we'll get this out to everybody who has attended this evening. And remember, we have 175 book reporter talks to author interviews available on our YouTube channel and wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Jenny, Jody, appreciate you both. Thank you. Yeah, honey. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah.